The person on the street thinks that creativity, risk, and passion are all an important integral part of entrepreneurship. Our book says no, those have nothing to do with entrepreneurship. So that's what the book is about. Anyone can be an entrepreneur. It requires no skill set at all. This podcast is part of the Blueberry Network, where listeners and podcasters come together. Find out more at blueberrywithnoease.com. The Eat Sleep Right podcast is brought to you by a generous grant from the Built on Dreams Media Network, with additional funding by the Sims Media Foundation, and from the generosity of listeners like you. Stand by, please. Rolling on set. On set. Welcome, everyone, to episode 53 of the Eat Sleep Right podcast. I'm your host, Adam Skull. The podcast is available at eatsleepright.net as well as in the iTunes store where you can also subscribe to it. The Eat Sleep Right podcast is also enjoyable at the public radio exchange at prx.org. Regular listeners know my purpose is to find out how writers became authors, how they got where they are, how they do what they do, and how they go from a blank page to a finished manuscript. If you enjoy the Eat Sleep Write podcast or have had your own success in writing, I'd like to hear from you. Tell me about yourself and your story, and they may get back to you and have you as a guest on the Eat Sleep Write podcast. If you have any questions or comments, anything at all, please write me. The email address is comments at eatsleepwrite.net. Jim Beach, welcome to the Eat Sleep Right podcast. It's great having you with me today. Thank you so much. It's an honor. You wrote one email to McGraw Hill Publishing. A week later, they jumped on you and handed you a contract. That's right. You know, I hear countless thousands of authors. The stereotypical story is that I sent this proposal, this letter, this email to 228 people and only the last one said yes. The story that you hear all of the time. We were strangely the exact opposite and I think I know why and I I think I can share that with the listeners today. But that's true. We sent one unsolicited email to McGraw-Hill. They wrote back The person, the recipient, wrote back probably within an hour saying this is an interesting topic. The email that we wrote was three lines long, and the email that came back was this is interesting, and they asked us to send a chapter. I sent three pages a week later. Two days after that, they wrote back saying, yes, we would like to publish this book. So the entire process from beginning to end probably took eight days less than one hour of work, they accepted the proposal based on just that. How did you feel when that occurred? Like the luckiest person on earth. I'm not a writer. I'm not an author by training. I was stumbling into this. I was doing it as a way to promote my primary business. And so the opportunity to become a McGraw-Hill author, I think that's fairly prestigious, I was overwhelmed. It was one of those situations where I ran around my room dancing with my arms up in the air, acting like a three-year-old child. I was so happy. When you sent in your email query blindly, who did you send it to? The back end of the story is I used to teach at Georgia State University here in Atlanta. Very, very good program. In the first semester, I had just sold a business with 700 employees, was doing pretty well. My head was pretty big. And I walked into class saying, this entrepreneurship stuff is not hard. Anyone can be an entrepreneur. My class thought I was insane and crazy. And I ended up making a bet with my class. I bet my class that I could start a business that semester. The class, the students got to choose the country and the industry that I would start the business in. And I had three months to make it 100% profitable, meaning cash flowing positive and having repaid all startup capital. So by every definition, it was a true operating business. 
I made that bet. The first semester, the students thought it was funny. They selected Pakistan and furniture. So I had three months to start a successful Pakistani furniture company. I did this 12 semesters in a row, and it started to get a little bit of notoriety in town for doing it. And a reporter wrote an article about it for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. That reporter is David Beasley, one of my co-authors. And David said, you know, you should really write a book about this. And I made him a bet. I said, David, if you can get a publisher to accept the book, I will write the book. He said, here's an email. He knew one guy at McGraw-Hill said, email this guy. And that's it. That's how I got the introduction. David didn't even bother to email him in advance saying, look out for this proposal. Just out of the blue, I emailed saying, I got your email address from my friend David Beasley. I would like to write a book. That's all it took. So I know that I am the luckiest author on earth. I know that it is the exact opposite of what everyone else wants to hear. They said yes. There were two other co-authors? David Beasley is a journalist with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He also ghostwrites. Chris Hanks is my speaking partner. He is the head of the entrepreneurship program at the University of Georgia. We do a lot of work together. I like to think of it as sort of a Lennon-McCartney type thing. A lot of times I will give his speeches because he's not available. A lot of times he will use my examples because it makes more sense in the speech that he is giving. The body of knowledge that was in this book is a body of knowledge that we both teach, that we teach together. So it made sense to include him as well. Plus, McGraw-Hill was very excited to have his name on the cover, hopefully because he would sell it to his hundreds of students every semester, thereby forcing and generating market every year for the book. You know, three or four hundred people to buy the book every year. But you wrote the whole book, even though they're listed as co-authors. I did write the whole book, yes. Once McGraw-Hill said yes, three of us sat down and talked about it. They only gave us a month. They asked if we could be done in one month, and we said yes. So we decided that the process would be that I would write, Chris would massage, and David would finalize and edit. I got a little bit behind. Chris got another project. So in the end, I just ended up cramming it out and writing it and sending each chapter directly to the editor at McGraw-Hill. In other words, you became chief cook and bottle washer. Yes, and janitor, the guy in charge of taking the trash out, all of those functions, yes. What does the average person think entrepreneurship is? Well, I think that's what's so interesting about our book is that our book is 100% counterintuitive. If you were to play Family Feud and Richard Dawson were to say the top three answers on the board are, the answers are very clear. Entrepreneurs are risk-taking, creative people that do things that they're passionate about. The person on the street thinks that creativity, risk, and passion are all an important, integral part of entrepreneurship. Our book says no, those have nothing to do with entrepreneurship. That's why we were able to get through all of the clutter and get published so quickly is our thesis was so counterintuitive, so provocative, that if I tell you I argue that entrepreneurship has nothing to do with risk, that creativity is bad for entrepreneurs, and that if you do something you're passionate about, that's called being in the bedroom, nothing to do with entrepreneurship, people think I'm crazy. The fact that I can defend it is why I got published, is why McGraw-Hill said, yes, we want to read a defense of that thesis. That's a, a thesis that's crazy, provocative, interesting. You can get on the radio and sell a lot of books about that. People are going to want to hear that defense. And so, yes, we would love to publish that book. The fact that I can defend the thesis is, I think, why it is sold so well and why we're working on a sequel right now. Entrepreneurship is not about risk. Entrepreneurs are the people that reduce risk to the point where it's a no-brainer to start a business. I start businesses all the time, but I don't ever take any risk. My wife won't let me. In the third grade, I drew a monster, and my art teacher came up to me and said, Jim, everybody knows that monsters can only have two heads. You can't have a monster with three heads. You're not creative. And so I learned in the third grade that I was not creative. 
93% of businesses around the world are copies of other businesses. There's nothing wrong with being a me too business. And then passion, I'm passionate. My number one passion in the world, other than having wonderful vacations at Disney with my beautiful family, my passion, if you said I had a hobby, would be woodworking. I cannot make a living doing what I am passionate about. Therefore, I have come to be passionate about the process. I'm passionate about the fact that I wear blue jeans. I'm passionate about the fact that I don't report to the man. I'm really passionate about the freedom and the fact that I'm in control of my own destiny. So that's what the book is about. Anyone can be an entrepreneur. It requires no skill set at all. Was it difficult for you to take this collective knowledge and put it into words? I'm a professional speaker for a living. I know for a fact that Sean Hannity and a lot of those radio people simply get transcripts of their radio shows and then massage that into a text. This is the process I used. I lecture on this exact topic two or three times a week. And so I simply took uh, an audio recording of my lecture and then took a transcript. And from there, I used the normal writing process. Thesis, A, B, C, thesis, came out with an outline. I took the pieces of the transcript that I had and was able to sort of put it together in almost like a jigsaw puzzle way. This little part would go good here, and I like this for chapter nine, and this is a really good example of what I want to talk about in chapter seven. In about a month of work, I had about 70,000 words that sort of made sense, and then I spent another month taking 70,000 words and condensing it into 50,000 words, 200 pages. What do you like best about writing, and what do you like least? I did not really like it. It was not a fun process for me. I moved two computers into my TV room where my family gathers, turned the family's living space into my workspace because I work better in front of the television sometimes, especially if I have to be there for eight or nine hours. My wife hated it. My family hated it. I had pieces of paper everywhere, the outline to the book over the window, so you couldn't really see out of the house. My family certainly did not enjoy it. I'm not a natural writer. It's something I have to work hard on every day, you know, when I do my blogging and things like that. So it was a very difficult process. I was just glad to get it done and get it behind me. It was a very good learning process for me. And now that I'm writing a second and third book, it's much, much easier. But I definitely struggled with it. I did not enjoy it. And it was something that I had to work really, really hard at. Do you still harbor any worries about writing the sequel? I actually am enjoying it a lot more now. My process is a little bit different. I'm not rushing it. One of the things I'm doing differently this time is I've decided to write the book before I approach the publisher. So I want to be 100% done. And because of that, I'm not under the same time pressure. And I'm enjoying it, I think, a lot more. I'm about halfway done now with my second book, a much easier process, and about a quarter of the way done with the third book. What was the most difficult part of that writing your book? Finding the time to do it, the motivation. You know, we all wake up and have emails that we want to respond to and the phone rings. The only way that I could do it was if I committed to writing before I ate breakfast in the morning and before I started answering my emails. So for me, the hardest part is the self-motivation, holding myself accountable each and every morning. How much of you is in the book or is it entirely in your viewpoint? We did write it in the third person, so we never say the word I or we. However, it's very autobiographical. We worked very hard to actually tone that down and to eliminate it. Instead of saying, here's another one of my stories, here's another one of my stories, we did use characters. I believe that in a nonfiction book that characters still add a tremendous amount. Every chapter we have another entrepreneur and we tell that entrepreneur's story, and then that reinforces the points that we wanted to make in the chapter. I find that much more interesting. Instead of learning ad nauseum about Chris and I, you're learning about Joey Tatum in Chapter 2, who for under $5,000 started a 12-restaurant-and-bar chain. And we think that's a really cool, sexy story. 
and it makes our point. So instead of saying, here's one of the companies I started, we introduce characters. And I do believe that characters are a very vital, important part of nonfiction as well. I think that's one of the reasons that this book has done well is because it's relatable. We tell the stories. Here's a guy who got laid off, was cleaning fish for a living, and now is a successful entrepreneur. Can you relate to that? Yeah, you can. Did you have an outline for the book, or did you write this by the seat of your pants? I had a 10-page outline. Yes, very, very long outline. And I thought that that was critical, and I still believe that. For my second book, I have a 8-page outline. I believe very much that you forget a certain story, you forget the way you want to turn a phrase in this particular instance, and all of that should be in the outline I like to do it before I start writing. Otherwise, I just start gibberish and I start going off on tangents. I find it absolutely critical to have an outline. Tell me more about the book. The number one thing about the book is our belief that anyone can be an entrepreneur. We try to have a very motivational book that's full of stories that are entertaining, but it's packed full of practical advice by non-academic people. Do this, number one. Do this, number two. Do this, number three. Could you read us an excerpt from the book? I would love to. This is from the chapter called Anyone Can Do It. A belief common among would-be entrepreneurs is that only a chosen few were cut out for this kind of work, and everyone else is destined for a life in the corporate grind. Some people think entrepreneurs have a specific genetic trait that makes them capable of taking big risks skirting colossal failure and achieving great success while all others are addicted to the security of a monthly paycheck and health insurance. But in helping thousands of people start their own businesses, we have discovered over and over again that this myth is simply not true. We believe that anyone, yes, anyone, can be a successful entrepreneur. People love to argue this with us, but they always lose. Exactly what skill is required in starting a business. Do you have to be smart? No. Most business owners are far from geniuses. Do you have to have earned some prestigious degree? No. Education in the form of a degree is irrelevant if you have the proper tools for success in place. We challenge you to find any criteria that a person must have in order to become a successful entrepreneur. The only characteristic that comes close to being necessary is raw desire and drive. And anyone who has picked up this book has demonstrated they have the requisite desire. What advice can you offer authors as to how they should approach their book as a business and how they can better succeed at marketing their book? I truly believe that it begins in day one with the thesis. It must be provocative, compelling, unique, and sexy. I see entrepreneur books all the time that are biographies of 20 successful entrepreneurs and it talks about the traits that successful entrepreneurs have. I've seen that book a hundred times. That book has been published 100 times. So if you were to send it to a publishing house, they've already seen it. I think you need to spend weeks, months, even years if it takes coming up with a thesis that is so compelling that when you tell it to someone, They stop and say, tell me the rest of the story. I want to hear the rest of the story right now. If the thesis is not so compelling, there's no reason to write the book at all. It starts with a thesis. Define thesis. The thesis is the one sentence that allows the publisher, the radio host, the book reviewer, or the consumer to know exactly what the book is about. You could say it's your marketing shtick. It's your elevator pitch. It is any way of encapsulating in one sentence what the book is about. I think that's the number one thing. That sentence must be sexy, sexy, and sexy. What's the nicest thing anybody ever said about your book? (laughs) My college roommate said that you could read this book in one good visit to the bathroom. I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult, but that's the thing I remember the most. He was very complimentary. But on the other hand, we're not trying to write a tomb. We're not trying to write a dissertation. We're trying to write an approachable book that any seventh grader can understand. What's the best advice anybody ever gave you? 
I was speaking at a conference on how to do small business. One of the other speakers turned to me and said, why aren't you just at home running your business right now? And I think that's true. We all spend a lot of time wasted on emails. I'm a huge fan of learning, but we do a lot of dumb learning. We do a lot of worthless networking, pointless networking. We're just randomly networking. Sometimes you're just better off at home working on your business. I am very excited to spread the message of entrepreneurship, but I also would like to encourage people you know, maybe some non-authors out there that they can do this. You know, I didn't go to journalism school. I've never been considered a writer before, but I was able to pull it off. And people say that the book is good. It's got over 50 five-star reviews on Amazon and only four four-star reviews. So the content has been well-received. I'm nothing special. My partners and I are nothing special. All we did is discover one thing, and that's that a sexy sentence can sell thousands of books. School for Startups, wrap it up, will you? I would encourage people to try to give it a good shot. I love the self-publishing world, and I'm probably going to be moving there myself very soon. Everyone should write a book. It is the ultimate business card. Nothing is sexier than walking into a meeting and saying, here's my book. I have done over 200 radio interviews promoting my book. I can tell after I've been on an interview that it sells. Being an author for me also means that I'm becoming a how to get on the radio specialist. I spend almost all of my Sunday emailing radio hosts asking to be on their radio show. I'm very aggressive about it. I think the discouraging thing that I have to tell all authors is that writing the book is 25% of the process. If no one reads the damn thing, why'd you write it in the first place? I have a friend who wrote what I consider the greatest book since Atlas Shrugged, and 12 people have read it, including like my I made my mother read it just so that we could say 12, not 11. I feel so sorry for him. 75% of publishing, of writing now, is about getting out there and promoting it. And that's just as important. Spend time planning on the book, but my goodness, Spend more time selling the darn thing. Once it's published, your process has just begun. So I would recommend going on Google and typing in radio show and then whatever topic you're writing about. If you're writing about healthcare or nutrition, type in radio show nutrition and email hundreds of radio show hosts. Hundreds. Uh, it's just as important to market as is to write a good book. Unfortunately, it's maybe even more important to market than to write a good book, and I hate to say that. Your takeaway advice to a writer? Go home and throw away the remote. Lock yourself in a room until it's done. Uh, Ten hours a day of writing is what it takes, for me anyway. You can't write a book an hour a day. I, I meet a lot of people who say, I'll write it you know, from 7 to 8 every morning. 52 years later, they're still working on it. I think that writing is a full-time job, a full-time process, and you need to treat it as such. That means it deserves a full nine-hour workday. Jim Beach, thank you so much for being with me today on the Eat Sleep Write podcast. I know my listeners will enjoy your work and your interview. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I hope the listeners have enjoyed it. If you're looking for a group of like-minded individuals who can offer support tools and advice to start your own adventures in writing, then prepare to have the cauldron of your imagination stirred. I started Eat Sleep Write for one purpose, to do everything I can to get your voice heard about your writing and to get more eyes on your books. My goal is to help you achieve the success you so richly deserve, and I salute your success in writing. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Eat Sleep Right podcast, located at eatsleepright.net. Please send any questions, comments, or suggestions to comments at eatsleepright.net. Please consider a donation to support the Eat Sleep Right podcast. Donations can be sent to our PayPal address at donations at eatsleepright.net. Once in a lifetime, the theme music for the Eat Sleep Right podcast, courtesy of Stephen Paul. All rights reserved, used by permission. Please join us again for the next edition of the Eat Sleep Right podcast. 